All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a discussion of the Idan trilogy. We are going to be starting out with some non-spoiler questions, responses, discussion, and then we'll move on to spoilers for book one, The Way of Idan. And then we will move on to spoilers for The Prophet of Idan, book two. And finally, we will touch on Return to Adan. We won't be doing full spoilers for Return to Adan uh, because not every single one of my guests has read the entirety of it yet. Uh, but, uh, well, one of them hasn't. <laughs> so we will stick to some more general questions about Return to Adan. And speaking of my guests, I am very happy to introduce these three. Let's start with uh, Big Al, who has a channel that I want to shout about, actually, because I think that uh, a lot of people will uh, love your channel, Al, when they discover it. Uh, I, I hope that some people will go on from this video to check out your channel because it is a fantastic channel. I love your reviews. You keep them very pithy uh, and you do a wonderful job there. Uh, I'd love to see your channel blow up a little bit, as they say here on YouTube. So thank you so much for being here, Al. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you, Philip. That's very gracious of you to say so. Um, it's just a trivial little channel, really. Um, it's a fantasy first channel like your own. I, I do about 50% of my books, uh, all my content around fantasy. And then I like to weave in a few you know, classics and a bit of historical stuff in there as well. Fantastic. You're doing a great job. You're doing a really great job on that channel. So thank you so much for being here and for reading the trilogy. Uh, and below Big Al, uh, we have, oh, by the way, Al's uh, YouTube channel is Big Al Does Booktube. I will have a link to it in the description. Uh, and below him is somebody who does not have a YouTube channel, that at least that I know of. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe there's a secret one. Uh, I, I, ha I have a YouTube channel. It is full of useful AP macroeconomics uh, tutorials. Okay, you okay. You do All right. not want to check out. <laughs> this is this is because my guest here, Trevor, is a history teacher. Uh, and not just any history teacher. He is a history teacher, somebody I have known for a long time. In fact, he was my and is my best friend uh, from Vermont. Uh, we went to high school together. Actually started eighth grade, I think, right? It was eighth grade. I remember the day you introduced yourself. Yeah, in eighth grade. Yeah. So uh, yes, Trevor has known me a long time, probably uh, a little too well. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yes, he knows just how much of an idiot I was in high school. I can probably tell some embarrassing stories, but I'm sure he won't. Uh, and uh, it's just so wonderful to have you here, Trevor, uh, to uh, use this as, as an excuse to catch up. Also, I should mention, Trevor is sitting in our high school right now, because he works there as a history teacher. So dear old PA, People's Academy, there it is. So I, I do regret that I did not have a more scenic uh, area to uh, use as the backdrop, but uh, I only had access to my classroom today. I did, however, in my desk and setting stuff up, um, come across this photo. Oh my goodness, uh, there it is. Yep, oh, I see me. Uh, it's a, little blurry, it but... it's a beautiful building. We were rated I'm sitting in the room. front in case anyone's curious. Uh, it's a bit blurry, but uh, I'm sitting down on the steps. Yeah. Yes. That, that handsome yes okay. Here. There I am. Yeah. What a handsome fellow. <laughs> Fortunately, it's too blurry for them. I, but I did think I was here explicitly to tell embarrassing stories. So <laughs> I, I'm sorry if, if there was a confusion about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to change with my that, We will move on to my next guest. Uh, <laughs> so, thank you for being here, Trevor. I really appreciate it. Uh oh, the teacher's writing down something there. Okay. All right. My, my third guest is uh, somebody whose reviews I have come to deeply appreciate. Uh, very, very insightful very well articulated, uh, not just his reviews of my books, but uh, go and check out uh, his reviews on Goodreads, period. And somebody who's also fairly active on YouTube, not with a channel yet, uh, not with a channel, uh, but a, a participant in many a live stream and a great commenter, somebody whose presence I appreciate 
very much. And Daniel, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, now, I have no knowledge of how my display image on YouTube became my image. So this is what I look like now. I'm sorry for everyone who thinks I've deceived you <laughs> with my my uh, picture from uh, nearly 10 years ago. Um, wow. Yeah, but, uh, this is me. Yeah, I have been on the periphery of uh, BookTube, just kind of commenting and everything for many years now. Um, really, since before the pandemic, um, before Mike was doing BookTube. Um, so... Um, I was one of Patrick's first friends on Goodreads, actually. So, wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. So no channel, but I've been hanging around for a long time. <laughs> Have you ever thought about starting one? Um. Yes, I am. Um. I'm not good at uh, getting things done on my own. <laughs> I guess <laughs> so. Yeah. Um. I have thought about doing it. Um. And I just. I don't know. I uh, maybe I will someday. What I really like is, you know, doing discussions and things like that. Or cool. well, I mean, you know, participating in them in the comments. And uh, I don't think you can't really do that. You can't start a, a booktube channel and say, you know, I'm just going to get all the big names on here and we're going to sit around talking about books. You have to make some videos first. So, um, but you know, I'll think about it. See, see what all I can right. do. Fantastic. Well, and I also want to make one more little point. Daniel is also the person who produced two wonderful paintings uh, related to the Adan trilogy. One of an Aglac, which I shared on my community tab, and another one of the Elf, the Elf uh, from the Adan trilogy, uh, which also I shared on my community tab. Uh, so really cool stuff. And there is the Aglac. Whoa, <laughs> I love your- I, I love don't your have name. the Elf thing, but- um... yeah. So cool, so cool, so yeah. So, all right, well, with all that said, I think it's time for us to jump into the, our discussion. We, again, are starting out spoiler-free. We're gonna begin with uh, any questions that you three might have that are spoiler-free. So if you haven't read the books yet, you can stick around for this part of the discussion. Beginning with you, Big Al, what would you like to ask uh, in regard to the trilogy or writing or whatever you like, uh, spoiler-free? Okay. Um, yeah. So the first question I have is, uh, has there been a comparison made to your works um, by a reviewer or a commenter that has surprised you? Oh, gosh. Uh, you know, that's interesting. Uh, initially, I was surprised when Mike from Mike's book reviews compared my writing to uh, Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett and to Tad Williams, uh, specifically, I think, uh, the uh, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn uh, trilogy, which is really a tetralogy. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's published here at least as four books. Uh, so, because the third book was so long. Uh, so, but yeah, I, that initially caught me by surprise. Uh, and then I thought, because those are books that I read uh, back in the 90s. Uh, and so it had been a long time. Uh, but after he made the comparison, I thought, you know, they're, they're probably, you know, swirling around in here somewhere or other. And I thought, you know, that's actually a very apt comparison, particularly I, I felt maybe the Tad Williams one, because Memory, Star and Thorn does straddle a kind of classical fantasy and more modern uh, fantasy kind of thing. If you, I don't know if you guys have read Memory, Star and Thorn. Um, but that's how I look at it anyway. And I feel like I'm doing something maybe a lot, at least people have told me uh, that what I'm writing is reminiscent of classical fantasy in some ways, but with a, a modern take. Uh, so, so yeah, that probably is the one that um, was like, oh, okay. And a lot of people said, you know, the more obvious to me, at least was like Tolkien. I've talked a lot about Ursula Le Guin in terms of the prose maybe. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, Others uh, that people have talked about that I would not have thought of um, and probably weren't initially influences actually because I started writing before I read them include Wheel of Time uh, uh, as another one. Uh, but I actually didn't read Wheel of Time until uh, I had finished the what was now the first two books. Uh, and then uh, Malazan, nobody's really compared it much to that but that's another one i didn't read until uh i had finished the first two books uh so but as you probably all know malazan is my favorite uh series of all time so people might wonder oh is malazan an influence not so much definitely for the first two 
I think maybe in the third in some interesting um, ways, perhaps. Um, but yeah, we'll see what people think. So yeah, that's my answer to that one. Uh, so thank you. Uh, now, Trevor, do you have a spoiler-free uh, question for me? Or yeah, sure. I've got just kind of lots of it, especially. But maybe you know, we'll start out with one about um, kind of the, maybe the writing process. Um, I'll start with this one. I mean, I, she, I don't know how much people know that I would think of you as as not as as much a, a linguist as a fantasy writer. Um, much inspired by Tolkien, this idea of creating uh, languages. Um, you know, and the point of me being here is to, uh, you know, give the insight to the background of, of who is Philip Chase. Um, one of the first conversations, and, and it came back to me, and I remembered this, um, you know, from reading the books, a, a scene in just one of those first weeks that I met you uh, sitting in a science class and, and people may not know that you had come from Germany. You had just come here from Germany. That's right. And of course, fascinated with the, uh, hey, say something in German. We, we, we would always make you uh, translate whatever a teacher was saying into uh, <laughs> German. And I think the first thing you ever said was kind of, was this, a wasser ist das wird ein. And I, that's either, that was not me. That, I'm quoting you directly. So if that was not what the German for water is the weird one, um, that's not <laughs> accurate. That was on you, because that's what you said. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. But <laughs> language has always been important to you. Yes. So, uh, and that's definitely clear in in the writing and in, in the book. So I'm kind of losing track of how many different languages have you developed for this? Uh -huh. um, where did they come from? What's the background in them? Uh, and then when you finish that, I have a follow-up question okay. about authors who create foreign languages in their work. Okay, gosh. All right. So first of all, I guess a confession, I cheated uh, on the languages. Uh, so the let's start with the language of the Ilark High, uh, your, your boy Munzil, right? His his native tongue. Uh, so he he's his language, uh, a, uh, a person, I believe, maybe from Scandinavia, I can't remember exactly where, um, but one one reader commented that the language of the Ilarchai sounds like German being spoken by a drunken Norwegian, which I thought was <laughs> probably a pretty apt description. It's supposed to be kind of a proto-Germanic, which has some definitely some Old English influence in there, a tiny bit of Old Norse, uh, and some German influence. Uh, so something that I just made up, but sounds like uh, something that, and I've had German speakers also say, well, thanks for making fun of my language here. <laughs> so <laughs> I have, and, and say, I can actually understand most of what those people are saying. Uh, and I believe that they can. Uh, so that's kind of cool. The language of the Thioths, so Orvandil's language, is much more purely based on Old Norse uh, and the sounds of Old Norse. So Valfoss, for example, the 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 the, uh, the town that is the, the chief place of the Thios up in Grimrick, simply does mean exactly what it says in the book: slaughter by the falls or slaughter falls. Um, so, uh, and that's related to the history because I, I as much as uh, possible, I, I did tie place names and and even personal names to uh, their the actual meaning. Um, so I, I had fun with that, and sometimes I had some. A little too much fun, like I named a river Ea, which in Old English just means river. So it's the river river. Um, so <laughs> so I had a little bit of fun, a few nods and winks here and there. Uh, and how about the song of origin? The song of origin, oh, the, the magic okay. yeah. building. The song of origins, I just made up. Like from like out of my my muddled imagination. Uh, it's probably got some influence from Latin but also uh, perhaps from what I at least imagine to be Sanskrit. Uh, I don't know Sanskrit really, so it's just for my imaginary version of Sanskrit, but it's a highly inflected uh, language. 
In other words, the meaning depends on the ending on the words, not on the word order. Um, so it's in, in that sense, I tried to give it the sense of a, a much more archaic, ancient language. Um, and I tried to be consistent with those endings. Um, so yeah, uh, that's that one's really the most made up of all the the song of the language of the song of origins, the language of magic. And then we have um, on Dunic, which is based on the sounds of Welsh. And then we have Andumaic, which in my world is related to Andunic, um, but it's, it's different. And that is much more purely based on uh, a South Asian kind of language, uh, which I'm basing on Nepali, which I speak to some degree, at least I can have a conversation with a four year or five year old. <laughs> um, but uh, it's definitely somebody who speaks Nepali or Hindi, or, or or such, they would look at that and say, "Oh, I I know what he's saying there." Um, so it's a kind of garbled version of those, I guess you could say. Um, so yeah, and then the main language, the one that you never actually see because it's the one that most of the characters converse in, is the the northern tongue. But if you could hear it from the perspective of an outsider, it would sound like Old English. Um, and a lot of the names from those cultures, from Torland and the Mark, and from Elland. Uh, they are Old English derivative. Um, some I just stole right out of Beowulf, for example, Day Raven is a name I stole out of Beowulf. Um, lots of names I stole from Beta, the venerable Beta, who wrote the ecclesiastical history of the English people. Uh, so yeah, yeah, uh, th that's an Old English based culture. Um, interesting though, though, in the mark, the landscape is based on a place you know well, Trevor. Um, it is based on the mark. I tried to describe Vermont uh, 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 when I was describing the mark, that is. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. That was, that was that clear, was, right? You, 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 you clear, got yeah. that. I picked, I picked yeah, right yeah. up on that. <laughs> so what was your follow-up question? Well, so the follow-up is, you know, as a reader, whenever I find, you know, that an author has put so much effort into creating these languages and writing in that language, I, I always feel guilty when I just skim down by it. <laughs> um, and well, you should. Uh, I'm curious how, how you feel. <laughs> so now getting to talk to the authors, how, how do authors feel when after putting all that work in, into that? <laughs> That, that, you know, a certain percentage of their readers are just going like, yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, I, I don't know what they're saying here, so I'm just going to shut this down. Or do you get a lot of feedback from people? It sounds like you have had feedback from people going, oh, I, I actually uh, am seeing and appreciating and can make these connections to the, what you've created here. Yeah. Um, more often what I hear is people say, I just skip over the songs. Uh, you know, or the poems, um, which, you know, fine, I'm not gonna, you know, uh, I'm, if somebody wants to read the book, but not read the poems and songs, I'm, I'm not complaining, uh, no problem. But I do, I will say that the, the poems and the songs are thematically related and sometimes give a lot of back history uh, that can add to the immersion of the experience uh, if someone is so inclined to read them. Um, but uh, yeah, you don't have to read them uh, if you if you want to skip over those. Uh, I read every single poem and song I encounter in fantasy myself. I just feel like I, I'm too much of a completionist or whatever um, to to uh, if I if I skip even a couple lines of poetry, I feel like I haven't actually read the book. Um, and that's just my compulsive self. So yeah. So, yep, uh, but I don't take offense uh, if somebody skips the the weird foreign language stuff or the songs of origin uh, or that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah. But thank you for those questions. And uh, Daniel, it is now your turn to ask a uh, spoiler free question. Well, first, I'll say I do read all of the poems and songs, but I, if you're really proud of those songs of origin, I've got some bad news <laughs> about some of them. <laughs> In the more faster, you know, the faster paced parts of the uh, of the story, I'm I'm eager to get on to what's happening with the dragons down below. I I know what it's going to do. <laughs> I, I started to recognize. Oh, that's Al Mahdi. Okay, okay, we'll go down. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I I can't blame you for that. So yeah. So uh, the question I have, which I I think can be answered in a fairly spoiler free way. Um, 
I think, you know, what I've asserted in my review, and I don't know whether this is true or not, is that it seems like even though you've got a very uh, standard fantasy format, we've got the trilogy, is that's not really how I experienced it. Honestly, if the trilogy was going to be anywhere, it's in it's in those first two books and, you know, plot threads that I anticipated going through to the end did not. They A lot of things were wrapped up in the first two and then the third book is almost a sequel. So I don't, I don't know what specific question I have about that, but you know, whatever thoughts you have regarding my, uh, my idea in that, in that area. Yeah, no, I, I think you're onto something there. Uh, I think what I've done in the third book is unconventional to some degree, whereas the first two books are the sort of the conventional fantasy story, uh, until maybe the end of, of the second book. Um, where things start to point to, okay, a lot of people got to the end of Prophet of Eden and were like, what is he doing? You know, uh, where, what, what's he going to do with it? What are we doing in the part three here? Uh, which is the longest of the three. I think often in fantasy, there's a tendency to get to that final battle and have the, the main baddie meet his demise and uh, get this big, you know, epic resolution and then leave it at that. And I was interested in, well, what, what happens next? What about the repercussions? What about the fallout? What about the hero who's given everything for this outcome? What is that person like now? Uh, what is the person going through? What about this ravaged uh, land where you've had all these battles and wars? It just doesn't bounce back to normal overnight. So I thought, let's explore that. And that's what I did in the third book. Uh, I will say too, that I, I wrote the first, what is now the first two books initially as one book. And I got an agent who read that book and said, this is two books. Uh, and I said, okay, I wanted to make a trilogy anyway. So uh, I made it into two. And later, after reading more fantasy and exploring and thinking, well, how do I want to resolve this? I do want to do, I've always thought of it, what I want to do as the, as in, in, in hero's journey terms, as like the departure, transcendence and return. So the part three was always going to be the return. Um, and that applies to more than just Day Raven. That applies to lots of the characters in, in, in some certain ways. So, but I did write that later. So I wrote the, the first, what's now the first two books in my thirties. And then I started what's now the third book in my early 40s. Uh, so maybe I was a slightly different person by that time, too. Um, so you're absolutely right. In other words, Daniel, that uh, I think that it's it's a legitimate observation you're making there. Um, so, yeah. Any, anyone want to follow up on that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. So one of the questions I actually have here is exactly to that, that, often the typical structure we expect in a book of three acts uh you know as you said like a dramatic conclusion um i felt like it was much more naturally kind of set out than that it almost felt like each act almost had like a prologue and an epilogue and in a similar fashion as when you went read lord of the rings you know six books is it three books is it one book you know it's more of a natural uh you know occurring events and we're given uh the story in a more natural way i felt and um, especially when we, you know, got the third book, it didn't feel like traditional fantasy to me. It felt like a like a like a classic book. Mm. Um, the way I read it and the way I enjoyed it, um, I mean, my expectations were blown to pieces during the second book, anyway. So I felt uh -huh. like, you know, I'm just going to roll into this and treat it for what it is. And yeah, it did not feel like uh, fantasy at all to me. Uh, I did not get any will <laughs> other than obviously, you know, we've got the usual um, kind of things we expect in fantasy, but as far as, as the experience of reading it did not feel like fantasy to me. Cool. I, I'm taking that as a compliment. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, I think that that's true, but I think that um, anyone who hears that and thinks, Oh no, I, you know, I started reading this series and it had a lot of action in it. And that's, that is not lacking from the third book. And I, I think that's, that's a great thing is to be able to, 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 you know, write something that's, you know, is, is literary, whatever you want to have, you know, take that word to mean, but at the same time is very accessible 
you're not going to get bogged down and say, oh boy, Philip sure loves his language, doesn't he? You know, it'll, <laughs> it'll, it'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. Uh, there's still lots of action and adventure, but I think I, uh, but uh, Al is right to, and, and I think you're right to agree with him. I'm probably doing the most exploring in that third book, uh, which is where I really ultimately wanted to go anyway, um, in terms of uh, mortality, how we deal with it, and uh, how we're all connected to one another, uh, in what ways, um, how we're really quite tiny little things after all in a very vast uh, universe. Uh, so that's that's where I feel like I allowed myself to um, use this story to explore those things the most. Um, so, yeah, so great. All right, so shall we move on then to The Way of a Dan? We're gonna do spoilers. Uh, so if you have not yet read The Way of a Dan, this is your, your uh, warning where you're gonna start spoiling The Way of a Dan with some questions, observations, discussion. So Al, would you like to start us out? Yeah, so, one of the feelings I get from The Way of Dan is that this is going to be a very rereadable book, um, mm -hmm. that maybe I didn't infer everything I wanted to the first time around. And that's extremely obvious to me now that I've finished the trilogy. So yeah. it's definitely one I'm going to have to get back to, to really get the most from. But, you know, from the outset, obviously, there we have kind of a big fake out early on. Um, that just had me roll out in stitches. That was hilarious to me. Um, I don't know how much you want to spoil that kind of thing, but um, well, but we're yeah, spoiling I, it I, now, I so yeah, strong. yeah. Like I know this feels like a book that was written in the nineties, and I mean that in a very good way because I've really missed that style of writing. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking, oh, this is going to be the wheel of time, and then the fake out came, and that was just that was great. Uh, you know, <laughs> and, and, and got like such a um, an interesting grounding from then on. Um, that it really, you know, straight away, my expectations were shattered, and I was put on the back foot, which I really appreciate. Yeah. Oh, good. So you're referring to poor um, Oswe, I think, right, in the, uh, the first chapter, who I think a lot of people have said to me, I thought that was going to be your main character, and then he um, meets a rather grisly and early demise, uh, thanks to the pukas, um, who have been stirred up by the, the priests and, and the soldiers of Torland in the service of their uh, planned war of conquest. So uh, so that's something I wanted to link with that, um, the prologue with the three priests uh, who are martyring themselves uh, in order to give the Torlanders an excuse to uh, uh, launch their their holy war, and uh, you know, no coincidence that another dude in a white robe shows up uh, after Oswe's demise, and they're like, "Oh, poor kid. Oh well, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Too bad. Let's go back to Torland now." Um, so yeah, I'm trying to show early on. There's a, a sense of everything being linked um, here. Uh, even though these are very disparate places, the prologue takes place in Cargillian in the south, and then we go over to the Mark uh, in the first chapter. And then in the second chapter, we visit Sequara down in Astrolad. Uh, and in contrast to the deaths that we've seen, she saves a child's life. Um, so trying to link that all together early on, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I appreciate that you, you feel like you could reread it. Uh, I think there are a lot of things that you don't quite get until book three. Uh, until the end of book three, uh, in regard to very key events that happened early on in the way of a Dan. Um, so yeah, not spoiling anything though. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah, Trevor, a question related to the way of a Dan. Well, I, I'll just follow up on, on on Big Al's idea of this feels very much like a book written in the '90s um, because it was. Um, the way of Edan was probably late, maybe early, early 2000s. 2000s. I saw, actually started in 2004, uh, actually. And I, I remember reading that first draft 25 years ago. Um, yeah, 20 and, years ago. And I, will, yeah. and I was able, I think, to pick up on, although I know it went through many, many, many revisions. Oh, yeah. Um, I think you can definitely pick up on uh, a maturity in the writing style by the second book. Um, I, I, I think you can follow your aging process uh, and your years of writing experience through the through the books. Um, 
because yeah. there's still a hint in in way of you done um of you know this was your first yeah. major writing effort and you can't revise all that away no, uh it, it, no. there's still going to be elements of that there but it definitely matures and grows over time so I, this probably isn't my question for here so much but uh, i am curious too i know you have other books in mind uh, -huh. uh you've got a future <laughs> to as a writer uh, ahead of you and i know you've got other ideas in mind what do you think about how would you how are you going to approach those new books differently than you know now all these years later uh as a writer this took 30 years yeah um uh, we're hoping we don't wait 30 years for the next <laughs> so as a writer what do you what do you do now how do you approach this now what have you learned that's going to yeah help you move forward and yeah what are some bigger uh, lessons a lot of little things actually uh just about the craft of writing um i i've learned along the way which it's true of anything that you 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 do and you practice it and you can hopefully get better at it um you listen to people uh i've worked with some really great people i mentioned that agent uh he helped me to improve the story I worked with a fantastic developmental editor in AP Canavan, who is uh, also on uh, YouTube uh, as a critical dragon. Uh, just a wonderful developmental editor, uh, very insightful, great eye for the narrative integrity of a story. So listen to people like that, um, seek them out, talk to nice people like you three uh, and uh, get feedback and grow from it. And yeah, that's that's the main thing. I do have a standalone sequel that I'm going to be publishing next year in 2024. And I think it'll feel in many ways more like Return to a Dan than it does like The Way of a Dan, for example, um, because I wrote it after <laughs> after I wrote the trilogy. Uh, I do need to go back and revise it and work on it and uh, have AP look at it and revise it and work on it some more uh to to make it the best book i can um but yeah so i wanted to stay in that world for sure for a little while i have some ideas kicking around my head for other uh journeys in in jormanland or even beyond its shores uh so hopefully i'll be able to hang out there for a while and, and deliver some more stories that people will enjoy and if i ever get tired of, of being there maybe i'll uh, start something new uh, but Definitely fantasy. I would stay in, in fantasy uh, for sure. So yeah. Yep. It is an incredibly fun learning experience. You also have to just enjoy the ride. You have to enjoy the, the craft, the day in, day out, you know, uh, making yourself right. And sometimes it's not easy, um, but uh, it's incredibly fulfilling uh, just working on a book. Uh, but now publishing these has been um, a dream come true, really. Uh, so I'm really happy to have people engaging with a story, making it come alive. Uh, um, so I'm very grateful for that. So, yeah. It, to, to just share this insight into the process and what it's been like to be on this journey with you for for 25 years. Yeah. Read, it's so fulfilling now to read the book and there's just little scenes to go, oh, that's what he was doing. Um, we have another a very close friend uh, who's a blacksmith that we yes. um, a lot yeah. of time with and just so many, so many trips. I'm now going like, oh, okay, this this was you figuring out how to make Damascus swords. That's what that whole conversation was about. And and yeah. then to find this little scene where you're describing a sword. And then we took we took a little sailing trip one day and and it was two hours of That's you right. just grilling him on all little subtleties of sailing and and then to see that show up in the book and the, you know the, the scene with them crossing the sea and uh, all the little technical details. Um yep. you know it it's been you're constantly looking at the world going okay how how does this actually really work and how does it work into the book i love the story you tell about having a description of the forest and then somebody telling you that 
Uh, no, those trees wouldn't exist in an ancient forest. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> write out all the birch trees because the birch trees aren't in ancient forests. So yeah. um, it's been 25 years of watching you put this story together. And it's great to now see it on the page. And yeah. That all was. Yeah. Yeah. Birch trees are, are colonizing trees. So they wouldn't be in, in the midst of a deep forest, but they'd be on the outskirts. Uh, so. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it, uh, Lucian is uh, the friend that uh, Trevor is referring to. You, you can find, he's a, he has a, actually a website, Lucian Avery Blacksmith, I think is, is what it's called. He is a blacksmith and I absolutely did uh, pick his brain. There's a certain scene in The Way of Adan uh, when Gnorn and Flock lead Day Raven and Imhar to a forge. And that forge is pretty much the way that Lucian described it to me. So yeah, I'm just stealing from my friends. <laughs> and he is also the person, he's a very, very smart guy, Lucian is. Uh, also helped me understand sailing a little bit. Um, any errors that remain in my sailing descriptions are mine, uh, but uh, yeah, he really helped me a lot to get a grasp on that. Uh, so yeah, yep. That's, it's kind of one of the fun aspects of writing, I guess, is, uh, and I still made mistakes, you know, uh, <laughs> with certain things, uh, but, um, you know, nobody's going to be able to capture every realm of life perfectly. Um, and it's fantasy, so I can always lean on that, well, it's fantasy, so it doesn't have to be accurate, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So cool. All right, Daniel, do you have a, a way of a Dan question for me? Yeah, you know, um, I think that, well, this applies to the whole series, but in particular, I mean, Big Al already mentioned the beginning of The Wavy Dan. Um, I think that you really see it here where there's the story that you're reading, but then there's another level, maybe several other levels uh, on which you can appreciate it. And I think especially in the beginning, that's something, you know, I also thought it was hilarious when Osby dies because you were just, I knew that the protagonist's name was Day Raven. I just thought, well, it's fantasy. He could be, you know, the second protagonist. This is awesome. This is obviously the protagonist. The, the, the narrative was screaming at me. This, this is the protagonist. <laughs> and then he just dies. Um, and this is after the prologue. You know, I, the prologue character dies sometimes. We've, we've read A Song of Ice and Fire. It's fine. That's normal. Okay, I, I know what this is. But this is definitely the protagonist. So I think if you hadn't read a lot of fantasy, that isn't your reaction. And in fact... You know, fortunately, reading is a, a solitary kind of pastime, because if this was something we were sharing with other people, I think a lot of people would probably be horrified by our reaction if they didn't know a lot about fantasy. Um, <laughs> because you're yeah. telling you're kind of telling two stories there. You know, it's it's terrible what happens to us. It's, it's violent and it's it's uh, shocking to any reader, because even if you are experiencing fantasy, you're expecting him to get out of it. This is the inciting event where he, oh, that was a close call, but he got those pukas. Um, and uh, you went the other way. So it's unexpected for everyone. Um, but I think somebody who knows nothing about fantasy is just horrified by it. And, you know, if they see us laughing, they probably think, well, uh, but um, it, it, I don't know, you know, to what extent this was an intentional, intentional approach for you. Um but I, I see that kind of running through all the books where there, there are different things to appreciate depending upon your own personal history with reading and various genres and everything. So um, I don't know. Did, did you did you do that on purpose, I guess, is my question. Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is me. Um, you know, even Mark Lawrence says on the cover, a novel born of love for the story. Uh, so I, it. it it is for me that I, I've had a long time. Trevor knows how long I've been obsessed with fantasy. Um, and ever since I was 12, 13 years old, you know, um, Lord of the Rings made me want to just say to myself, yeah, that that's that. I want to do that. You know, I want to do that for people. What Tolkien did for me delivering catharsis. I had no idea what that was when I was that age, but that's what he did for me. And I thought, yeah, that. Um, so, yeah, so I, it's intentional uh, for sure. Um, I'm trying to engage with the genre, um, uh, particularly I think in the first two books. And then I feel like I still am engaged with the genre in the third book, but that I to some degree just leave it behind and do my own thing maybe a little bit more in the third. Um, so, uh, and again, that's very much intentional, um, with, uh, the return to a Dan. Uh, so yeah, um, did it on purpose, uh, for sure. Uh, poor Oswe. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, I wanted the violence 
and I wanted to send a message to a potential reader right away that the violence in this book is going to be brutal at times. It is going to be visceral. I am not going to try to glorify it. I am trying to uh, make it feel as horrible as it would be in life. Um, and so that was important to me, especially since I am exploring themes like mortality, but also the repercussions of a certain group of people trying to impose their vision on other groups of people through violence. And I want to try to explore what that really looks like. Uh, so I, I hope, I tried my best to be as honest as possible with, with the violence. Um, so that was another thing I was trying to signal right away. Yeah, this book is gonna have some violence in it. Um, and I'm not gonna shy away from how uh, awful that is. And if you identified with this character and you liked this character a little bit and it, it shocked you, good. You know, um, I, I was trying to do that. Um, so, yeah. Yep. Uh, so, uh, unless anybody wants to follow up on any of that, I think it is time to give everybody. Well, yeah. I, I, I wanted to just kind of say like uh, reading those violent scenes and you know, like where that comes out of you, because <laughs> you are far, far from a violent person. Um, <laughs> and you know, I was a little shocked and taken that you could you could go there, and uh, how comfortable I was going to be going. Jeez, oh I don't, I don't know if I want to know that Phil is, you know, thinking these thoughts. Um, but it was good at the right level. Where I was appreciative, I remember the first scene where Day Raven and she has not appeared in the books for a while, so I have to remind my name. His first girlfriend. Um, oh, Ebba. Ebba. Yeah. Ebba. Um, uh, I was pretty sure that a sex scene was on its way. Yeah. And I do have to say, I really appreciated that you did not go there. Right, right, right. Because <laughs> there I was like, I don't know if I can read Phil writing about sex. I don't know I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, thank you for pulling back on that. But with the violence, <laughs> keep going, keep going. That's good. <laughs> I'm so, that, that is going to be the most memorable comment. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I, I'm glad I spared you that awkwardness. Yes. Uh, so no, yeah, I, 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 that was also a deliberate, uh, I actually did experiment with writing um, a little bit of the, the naughty scenes uh, and then realized, especially after uh, talking with AP Kahneman about it, I realized. Uh, AP said, no, no, you don't. You <laughs> Yeah, that's not easy. <laughs> yeah, he, he helped set me straight there. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I, I realized that this is this is going to be just a little. No, I make if it makes me uncomfortable, it probably makes other people uncomfortable. So, yeah, yeah, my my daughter's over there making vomiting actions. So, <laughs> yeah, my children are reading you know this book that Uncle Phil has uh, written here. So, yes, yes. So it's not, I don't know, it, because of the violence, it's still not something I would want a, a younger teen to read necessarily, but an older teen maybe. Uh, so, yeah, but yeah, so. So anyway, moving on to uh, The Prophet of Adan, book two of the trilogy. Uh, let us begin with Al. What, uh, what would you like to ask me, Al? Uh, if, if you wouldn't mind indulging me, I just wanted to um, bridge the gap between Way and Prophet quickly. Sure, um, please do. Major spoilers for anyone watching this right now, but I was always wondering when you would introduce dragons. Ah. Um, and I was wondering, you know, Bledler looks like he has this, you know, <laughs> has this trump card um, up his sleeve. And I always, from the, from the, the first kind of scene, uh, introducing that character, I, I thought to myself, "This is this is where the dragons are going to come in, right?" And obviously, towards the end of Way of Dan, we kind of get that um, told to us. And uh, from that point, I felt like this is where there's like a tonal shift or like a structural shift. And from that moment at the end of that book, or you know, the closing chapters of uh, Way of Dan, right through to the end of Prophet, I felt like this is very modern fantasy. There's tons of action. It, it reads yeah. extremely yeah. quickly. Um, and this is what I was uh, expecting when I first started reading. Yeah. Um, 
or what I, I suppose I expect of most <clears throat> modern fantasy books. Um, but what I really appreciated in in, in Prophet was um, the siege. I, I love a siege. I'll get a siege in any book I can get it in. Um, and I don't know why, but I got, I got caught up with picturing um, the siege being this, the siege of you know, Constantinople at some point uh-huh. in its history. Sure. I don't know why. I don't know if there's something in the descriptions you used or or, or, or what. But um, was there a particular siege or, or set of sieges that kind of inspired you to to put that insert that into the Prophet Vida? Oh, what a great question! Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like to reply to your observation about the slight transition from the way of Eden to the Prophet of Eden. So another big influence that I I'm sure uh, affected my writing and my approach is uh, something that Trevor, I think, initially got me to read, which was A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, uh, It was uh, definitely a series that I can say without a doubt probably had some influence on what I was doing here. And more than any other author probably is responsible for me moving away from the more classical Tolkien type fantasy to the more visceral um uh, action oriented uh, kind of fantasy that you see in in the prophet of Edan, which i tried to signal right, right on the cover uh and uh you know also in the prologue the prologue to prophet of Edan is non-stop almost except for the very beginning with gnorn there you know thinking about his brother conversing in the dark with his, his deceased brother uh other than that, it's just nonstop action uh, in in the prologue, um, and so I tried to just come out with a big boom, you know, um, and and say, here's where we're getting the dragons, we're getting the action, uh, let's go, you know, and and not dropping the bigger important themes that I, I hope that I started in in the first book and continue with threads throughout the second, especially with Day Raven as he's learning to use the gift. Um, and then in the third book, where I just uh, I fully explore um, these these threads, these themes. So, yeah, I f- forgot the second part of your question though. What was it about? Uh, oh yeah, sorry about the siege. Was there you know what? Oh yes, the siege. siege. Yes, yes, yes. Why yes. siege in there? You know? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, Al. <laughs> that was my fault. Um, so yes, the Battle of Thulhan, which is the, kind of the climax here um, in book two. I don't think I had a particular, for this anyway, um, there are moments I can say, oh yeah, this is a story that I, I kind of, like um, when in, in the earlier battle where Day Raven and company are are fleeing after uh, Kiriath and Azrael has been sacked uh, by the Torlanders, Day Raven has failed, uh, Ord has died, uh, Queen Faldira has died. We've had that, um, you know, really awful traumatic stuff happened and they're fleeing in this sailboat, which I definitely got <laughs> help from, from our friend Lucian on. The idea that they would come to this isthmus and that he would create a wave that would go over the isthmus and into the great sea and leave behind their pursuers. That's something I sort of kind of got from the sagas where you had Vikings who could actually carry their ship or roll it at least across a narrow bit of land into another uh, body of water to escape or something of that nature. So, so I can definitely say, yeah, there, there's a definite thing there, but as far as the, the battle of Thulhan, it's probably a mishmash of all kinds of uh, real world sieges and, and battles. And of course the, 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 the dragon element, I, I hope adds uh, a, a kind of excitement to all of that. I was trying to work my way. This was this was also going to be a big moment for Orvandil, uh, who is the uh, you know in a different trilogy maybe he could have been the the, the protagonist even of, of uh, uh, but he has his uh, he, you know he earns the name Dragon Bane um, and that's something I tried to foreshadow as early as Abin the Bard uh, singing the song of creation and telling about the primeval dragon that emerges from the uh, the world tree, which I stole right out of Norse mythology, but I made it an oak because I like oaks. Um, and I called it Larath, uh, which is actually another name for Yggdrasil. Uh, so uh, you have this primordial dragon that emerges from there and then the gods emerge and they have to fight the dragon and they fire this weapon down that thing's throat um, and so that's that's an attempt at foreshadowing what Orvindil does in Thulhan. Uh, 
but yeah, I know I can't say there's a specific siege that I was actually thinking of. Maybe it remind it'll remind some people of specific sieges, though. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a, that's the kind of question I could go on and on about, really. Uh, so fantastic. Um, any follow up on that, Al, or shall I move on to Trevor? Yeah, no, um, I'll, I'll have some stuff later. Okay, right. cool, cool, cool. All right, Trevor, prophet of Eden. Yeah, I think I might I might follow up on it i guess with this one oh, geez there's so many cool things i do want to ask how i'll go with this way how do you balance you've got this antagonist you know the, the good guys versus the bad guys and the bad guys just seem to be so overpowered and there's there's no hope And yet, if you make them that overpowered and no hope, then you, as the reader, go, well, then obviously, you know, reading that that, that the siege scene, uh, you you were going to go like every you're about to kill off every person in this world, <laughs> and you do kill plenty of them. Yeah. Or obviously, Day Raven's going to come and save the day. Right. Although I couldn't, the timeline was interesting there because you still thought he was kind of 12 days out um uh -huh. from being able to show up to the city so i was like well how are you going to save the day but obviously you're going to save the day um or else you've made bleda and his dragons so overpowered and so mismatched that you're just going to kill everybody so how do you approach that as the writer to get the right balance and i'm curious if you did any revision or thought with that of just a nice a nice enough balance and edge to make the reader think this could still go any way uh-huh yeah that's very hard to do uh that is something that um and i hope i did it in a way ultimately even though probably everybody thought oh, yeah day raven is going to show up somehow or other and save the day um but I hope I did it in a way, at least at the very end, where it's hinted that more than hinted, because Day Raven does lose himself uh, to the elf. He becomes essentially uh, a creature that is um, ethereal and otherworldly and indifferent to uh, our individual existences. So, you know, he he does become that. And the only reason he doesn't kill everybody. Uh, that he just didn't suck away all their souls and, and take away all the suffering and the misery, you know, because the elf, its perspective is is way outside of our perspective. It, it is timeless. It is ethereal. And it sees this world and it sees the uh, suffering in this world, uh, mm, a great proportion of which is caused by humans uh, and we inflict it on other humans and other creatures so the logical conclusion of such a being would be, well, let's just get rid of all that suffering. You know, we'll just take away the humans and the world will be OK. Right now, from our perspective, that's not a good decision. <laughs> and the question is, I guess, is humanity redeemable? Are we, in fact, redeemable? Are we worth it? Are we capable of enough compassion and love and beauty and wonder to make our presence on this world worth it? The elf has one answer, Day Raven has another. But in that moment, the elf takes over and it was going to exert its its will, its logic. If it hadn't been for Sequara and her presence there, um, and she's the one who brings Day Raven back, not only because he loves her, but because she literally has his memories rolling around in her head from the time that she healed him back in the first book. Um, so I hope there was some tension over that, at least. Um, and the, the, the question was probably never, will Day Raven arrive in time, in time to save the day? The question may be uh, rather, what's going to be left of him when he does it, um, if anything? Um, and that's what I really do explore more in, in the third book. Uh, not to spoil it, but uh, that, that's kind of where I go with it. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, and thinking this through and talking about it now, it goes back to our earlier question of why is there a third book? Yeah. Um, because in the end, I think uh, it was satisfying because, yeah, Day Raven's going to fly in on the big dragon, the Deus Machinus, and save the day. Yeah. But, but he doesn't. 
it doesn't save the day. It stops things at that moment, deals with Ledla. But the whole purpose of the third book is the, it hasn't saved the day. There's still a massive mess yep. to clean up. Um, and no blood. So it gives justification <laughs> for um, why there is a third book. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I, and I think Jormund, uh takes over the mantle. Uh, literally, he becomes this, the new Supreme Priest. But it's Yoruman's concerns that become more dominant in the third book, as opposed to Bledla's concerns, which were the impetus behind the first two books. Um, and that's a, that's a different obsession uh, in a way. Um, and Bledla is done away with, I was done with that character. Um, and, uh, you know, he meets his demise at the hands of, hopefully you've picked up on the fact that Erkenwald and, and Bledla didn't exactly love each other. Uh, a lot of tension going on between these two and, and uh, um, I, I felt like, okay, yeah, it's bloodless time, you know, um, at the battle of Thuhan and, uh, it's time to go somewhere else with this now, you know? So, yeah. So yeah, that, that's where I feel like the tension comes in is, yeah. Um, what, what, uh, what are we going to do with day Raven now? What's he going to become? Um, and you know, he has that moment of transcendence. Uh, you know, first of all, there's the moment under the oak tree in the forest where he has that Buddha-like, you know, experience. But then later he also has the exchange with Gorsarhad, the mother of dragons. And it's, which is very much based on Old Norse, you know, just read the Volsung saga where, you know, Sigurd encounters Fafnir and you'll have a model, uh, which Tolkien obviously used in The Hobbit too, uh, when Bilbo meets Smaug, right? Um who calls himself Barrel Rider and all of that? Tolkien didn't make all that up. He that's that's a that's a saga thing, right? That's that's how you talk to dragons, right? Uh, you don't tell them your name. That would be crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how that works. So, yeah. Uh, shall we move on to Daniel then uh, for your prophet of Dan question? Well, you know, I've been listening to the discussion and my own question has completely left my mind. So. Oh no. <laughs> uh, you know, um, I, I, uh, what I was really thinking about was the, uh, the paradox at the heart of, of what the elf is kind of threatening. Um, because it, I, I, you know, I, I don't know that I can, that I can answer that question, even though the, the knee jerk answer to the question is of course humanity is worth it. I don't want to die. Um, I don't know that that I can answer that question because we do inflict a lot of pain and suffering. And yet, if you remove us from the equation, who is there to say that there's any pain and suffering anyhow? Um, and and I know we we yeah. do inflict, um, you know, pain on the natural world and everything. But I mean, for the most part, the, the reason anything is beautiful, the reason anything is terrible is um, is because of us. So the the whole question becomes this kind of, uh, you know, this thing that looks in on itself, which I think is very appropriate for what, what the elf is. There's kind of a, yeah. you know, yeah. So that's not a question, but that's what I have to say. Oh, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. And I think the, the third book it probably uh, is, is where I wrestle with that the most, but it, it definitely is, probably uh the the driving force behind the ending of the prophet of adan as well um and that's you're absolutely right it, you know we're 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 exploring these questions and we're the ones who are imposing i mean i don't know uh do the other creatures in this world uh experience beauty do they experience wonder uh we know that they experience a lot more than we used to think um they experience sorrow for sure you know we know that you know, other creatures miss their loved ones when they pass away. You know, there's Coco the gorilla, for example, whose kitten died and Coco expressed her sorrow um, on that occasion and was visibly depressed, um, you know, and, and was able to sign language and tell the, the people around her, yeah, I'm, I'm very sad. I lost my friend. I lost my kitten, you know. So they clearly experience emotions um and and all of that um so the question of uh you know uh a certain amount of suffering seems to be intrinsic to existence i guess right um yeah. 
we have uh, a world where life feeds on life. Life feeds on life. Um, even if you're a vegetarian like me, you you still eat organic living things. Um, you know, ask the carrot if it really wants to be eaten. You know, if it could answer, maybe it would say, no, don't eat me. <laughs> uh, so uh, in a world where life feeds on life, I think that brings up some interesting questions about our connection to other creatures, to life itself, to the foundation of existence. And these are questions that, to me, the a, a kind of, I'm not a practicing Buddhist or anything like that, but I am fascinated by the Buddhist answers to those questions, um, where there is this sense of oneness, the sense of transcendence that uh, one can experience while one is here, that you can transcend the self and realize your connection, not only to other people, but to life itself. Um, so yeah, this is something that was definitely, I, I tried to explore this in, in all three books, but especially, I, I mean, it starts with the elf, with Day Raven encountering the elf in book one. Um, and hopefully you, people can see it continuing all the way through, but um, really me wrestling with it in, in return to a Dan. So yeah. Yeah, that, that's, I mean, that, that's what I appreciate most about the magic. I mean, how many times have you read something with magic and you think, oh, I wish this could be real. And no, your magic isn't real, but there are elements to the experience of it. If you if you have read about, you know, uh, you know Buddhism in particular, but, but various other traditions as well, and people talk about various transcendent experiences they've had, you can experience something almost exactly like that. You won't be able yeah. to, you know, then get into the mind of an animal and make them do something for you. No. Um, some people would tell you that they can, but I don't think so. Um, but you can experience exactly that. That's it's real. And uh, I, I really like that about, uh, about reading the series, yeah. which again, isn't a question, but <laughs> yeah, I'll, when, I'll continue. I, when I was about 16 years old, I did experience it a couple of times uh, within the framework of Christianity. Um, so, you know, I used to pray a lot. I used to read the Bible a lot. And so it, it's something I'm not sure. I mean, I'm sure there's some chemical process that people could talk about going on in here when these things, when people have these types of, uh, whatever you call them, mystical experiences. I, I, I've heard them, you know, people who do meditation describe something. Oh, I think it's the same thing. Um, but uh, yeah, and of course, that is something that uh, you don't forget um, and something I'm clearly um, trying to explore here in, in the trilogy. Um, so, yep. Yep. All right. Uh, so I think we've covered profit. So uh, now we can move on to book three, Return to Adan. We are not doing full spoilers for Return to Adan. So if you have not yet read it, fear not. We are not going to spoil the ending or anything like that. Uh, because Trevor hasn't read it yet, um, but he's getting there. So we, I feel like we can talk about this some. Uh, so Trevor, maybe you could start this time though. Uh, and, and just up to the point where you are, do you have any questions or observations from return to it? And the point where you are is where exactly a couple hundred pages. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a hundred pages in. A hundred pages in. Okay. I, I do have a burning question. Okay, good, good. From those, what experiences in your life and background shaped uh, the relationship between Skuld and Monzel? Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, I know Munzel's your favorite, right? Um, so... Uh... <laughs> every author draws from their own experience yes so I, I can think of a few incidences perhaps that oh, is a, a two, <laughs> and, and, and i just hope as i read uh as i continue the book we'll we'll be able to explore this yeah this relationship I, I, I would hate to between. ruin that relationship for anyone by being too specific about my exact inspirations there but uh <laughs> but uh i can't say that i um completely see myself in any of the characters uh, including munzil or scold uh for that matter uh but uh there's a bit of me in most of them actually in one way or another munzil's a character that i really do 
feel for. You meet him in the second book. He is the last survivor. There's this wonderful passage in Beowulf that many people refer to as the lay of the last survivor. And this is about a person who uh, dismally is the last among his people. And he has his people's treasure and he buries it. He puts it in a barrow which later on a dragon discovers and sits on, and that's the dragon that Beowulf fights and kills and gets killed by. Um, so this is a very poignant moment in the, in the poem where you have this person who is lamenting the loss of his people. And here you see the, the incredible uh, significance of one's identity being wrapped up in one's tribe, in one's people. You are nothing without those other faces that reflect who you are. And for Munzil, he he lost his tribe. He's the last of the gray wolves uh, when, when we meet him right away. That is kind of his defining characteristic. Uh, the, the chapter where we meet him is, I think, called The Last Survivor. Um, and so that, that is something that um, for him to find a meaningful relationship again um, is, uh, is, is uh, an, almost a resurrection of a sort. For him to find meaning in connecting with his, these people. So he was one of the gray wolves, but he has altered the perception of the Ilarkai or as folk of the tribes, as they call themselves. He's altered their perception of their own in-group. So it used to be just the tribe. Now, no, all of us are the in-group. And it's, I'm fascinated by how we humans have done this uh, throughout history, how we have gone from smaller in-groups where anyone outside our clan is bad, is other, is, deserves to be killed, uh, whatever. It is, it's a matter of survival, you could say, in, in a harsh world. And then that expands to maybe a tribe, which expands to a kingdom, which now we live in countries. At what point do we realize that all of humanity is, is one tribe? You know, At what point do we transcend our smaller identities and connect with the entire world. Um, so this is something that I, I, I knew I wanted to explore through Munzil and through his loss and regaining of identity um, and schooled, his relationship with schooled, which I, I hope, you know, uh, gives people a sense of affection and, and that sort of thing, which you see developing in, <laughs> in the third book is, is uh, an important facet of that. Um, so I think I dodged your question pretty well there, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah okay good well done, yes, well done. Well done. totally thank you, thank you. <laughs> so al what would you like to ask me in general terms about uh return to a death um first if you will allow me indulge me i would like to praise uh return for a down first um oh, and i'd you. like to try and you know maybe sell the books to people watching at home in the first two books you get two great fantasy books but what you also do is you get access to uh, return to it um and for me it was a really special reading experience because it, it it dares it's very um it's very daring that it tries to ask the really important human questions um and uh, the biggest praise i can give is that when uh, that book arrived, I was 400 pages into uh, the brothers Karamazov. Oh, wow. And having put that down to read Return to Adan and then go back and finish the brothers Karamazov, I didn't feel put out at all um, because these are two books that ask similar questions in completely different ways. Wow. And, uh, wow. and, and they really look at some really big themes. So I was already being placed into that mind frame uh, that mindset rather um, and I was never really ripped out of it um, and the fact that I can explore those kind of themes and questions and ask questions of myself um, in a fantasy book was really important to me and I haven't read all the fantasy books out there um, you know I've, I've read less than 100 fantasy books um, mm. but I've not found that in another fantasy book yet and I mm. am hoping that I will discover you know in the next couple of years that there are other series out there like malazan um i was just gonna say will, malazan yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That, that will that will give that to me but this was the first book so far um in fantasy that 
has really gone and you and you said it earlier and, and in fact Daniel and and um, and Trevor they've all kind of touched on it in a way in that the it kind of opens your mind up. These books, they open your mind up and you start thinking about your life and your place in the universe. Yeah. And that's my favorite thing about reading um, is, is looking at these big questions, but from a different angle. Um, and I really appreciated that. And I, I just want to say thank you for bringing that to fantasy for me, um, because I feel like this book is a book that transcends its own trilogy in a way and that's not to belittle the, the great job you did on the first two books i just feel like um you know you're shooting for the stars with this one and i really appreciate you know just you know, having the minerals to go for that really um but as far as questions go i i, I didn't want to create any spoilers but because my questions are very character based uh -huh. my favorite my favorite character from the first book the second book and the third book is is joraman uh, uh -huh. i don't pronounce it but he is the most 3d and lived in character in this series in my opinion he is someone that i instantly saw as um not just a uh, trigger for plot points um not someone that can interact with the other characters and the themes but you can you can put yourself in his shoes and you can and, and look at the way his mind works and and, and the way he perceives uh, the adan universe um and it, it gives you a really important uh, reflection point i think in the series um, and he's a character that seems to evolve with the books as they go as well, which I really appreciate. Um, but I also really appreciated two characters that were brought back from the very early uh, parts of the way of Dan, mm -hmm. um, a certain um, captain, shall we say, and a certain priest. And I love those characters. And their return in the third book outdid anything I saw from them in the, in the first book and it was yeah. really nice. It was a really nice um, to kind of travel back to those memories of the first book um, mm. because it, you know, even though it'd only been six months, you know, you read so many books in between, you really yeah. need that, you know, that kind of you know, inflection point and stuff. So yeah. Um, what made you, did you always know you're going to bring characters back um, so late in the series and what made you kind of want to bring those back? Oh, what a great question. Um, yeah, so thanks for the words about Yoramon. I think he was probably one of my favorites to write. Um, and yeah, he's got the he's got the the ring that he's always toying with, and I'm trying to create some um some connection to this character who who does terrible things. Uh, and you know, if if, if I feel like that's one of the biggest challenges for a writer is to create a character who does terrible things, but that people can see themselves in. Um, and I feel that way about your mod. Um, uh, so, so thank you so much. As for those comeback characters uh, from, from book one. Yes. I, I wanted to return to some of the early events um, and kind of make this third book a full circle thing. I mean, it's called Return to a Dan for I can think of a few reasons. Uh, uh, and, and there are some important returns uh, of characters, of returning to certain places. Uh, and I can't mention all of that specifically, but you know what I mean if you've gotten to the end. Uh, and, and so I felt like those were threads that I needed to go back to. And they fit, I felt, uh, particularly the priests, uh, they fit into a very important part of the plot. Um, and they fulfilled a role. Thematically, too, I think they both fit. Tonally, they both fit with what I wanted to do with them. And hopefully created much more understanding for those characters than, you know, and, and I wouldn't blame anyone who didn't think much of them in the first book, because I wasn't trying to create much uh, understanding or sympathy for them in the first book. So that's something I've enjoyed doing, even with like a character like Bledla in the first book, I can say that I deliberately wanted to present him in the most villainous way from the beginning and later try to introduce some nuance, um, some doubt into this character who comes across as so self-righteous and so sure, so certain. And, and certainty is a scary thing sometimes uh, in people. So by creating some doubt within him, I hope I kind of humanize him a little bit. Um, so yeah, I was definitely trying to go back to these characters that uh, make a comeback um, in the third book, um, who appeared in the first, not in the second. 
And I, I think they they helped me. Those characters helped me to explore some uh, important aspects of uh, of uh, you know how how we get on in this world, you know, um, and how we can become so isolated and alone. And uh, that's a you know something you have to look at uh, when you're looking at connection. You have to look at its opposite, um, you know, isolation, alienation. Um, so these are all parts of the same thing. Right. They're all two sides of that same coin, like uh, beauty and sorrow and life and death. Right. Um, so connection and and alienation. Um, and those characters really did help me to explore that. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so finally, Daniel, uh, any uh, questions, observations on return to a dad? Well, let me see. I don't want to. A hundred pages really isn't that far in <laughs> to this very, very long book. So let me be careful about yeah. uh, what I talk about. Um, I mean, you know, to reiterate what a lot of other people said, I, I really do really like that. That is a conclusion a lot. Um, and, um, you know, that just the examination of, of the afterwards, because that's something you don't get a lot of. Um, and I think we could, we could probably go to the wheel of time, which you said was not a big influence on you. Um, and it's, oh. it's interesting. I thought of the wheel of time a lot, but I've read the wheel of time four times. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. so it's, you know, it's interesting, the dialogue that you kind of see between the reader. And so, you know, you're dealing with, you know, as, uh, Mark Lawrence said, it's written for the love of the story. You're dealing with, a lot of influences and things that you're sort of referencing or paying tribute to. Yeah. And, um, you know, you're dealing with these kind of chosen one tropes. And so, you know, I, I have a lot of experience with one particular chosen one story. And so again and again, it comes up to me, Oh, this is like the wheel of time. And you almost definitely were not thinking of that when, um, when you wrote it down. Yeah. Um, so I hadn't uh, read it yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, so kind of, I read wheel of time two. 2007 to 2009 i would say uh and i was done with the first draft of what's now the first two books by 2007 so yeah yeah so yeah but yeah right when the last book a wheel of time came out uh is when i finished the series when brandon sanderson finished the series for robert jordan i read the final book so who's to say it didn't influence the third book you know um i can't I can't think of specific things where Wheel of Time, you know, was not like, let's say something I read, Tolkien's obvious, all that. And then I would definitely say George R. R. Martin. Uh, as far as Jordan and, and Wheel of Time, I never consciously, now who is to say that unconscious influences don't work their way in though, you know? So I would never, I would never deny that. And I definitely had read Wheel of Time by the time I was writing the third book. So, yeah. Well, I think it's interesting how all these influences just kind of exist in, you know, in this universe, whether you've read it or not. I'm, yep. You know, obviously you, you have read Robin Hobb, but when you came up with the magic, you hadn't. And there, hadn't. you know, right no. at the beginning, yeah. you think, oh boy, that's just like the wit. He must have really liked, no, not not really. <laughs> just, it, they they all come from similar places. Yeah. Um, you might have somebody write something. Oh boy, this guy really likes George R. R. Martin. Maybe he's never read Martin. Maybe he just loves Tad Williams, and they they both did yeah. the same thing, you know. So yep, yep. I, I don't know. Yeah, I just all think it's magic uh, I've read about in fantasy. Uh, when I read The Wit, uh, in in the realm of the Elderlings, I thought, Oh no, somebody took my magic system. You know? <laughs> I, I I actually was pleased and also kind of shocked that oh it's not identical to the gift in 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 the Adan trilogy but of all the magic systems i've read i thought that's probably the most similar to what i'm trying to do uh, in in my trilogy and i hadn't read a bit of it until after i had read uh, written the books so yeah but yep there well, you how go much of the influence, how much of the influence is on the reader to make those connections um because I had been, you know, waiting for years. I'd, I'd gone through the entire Raymond Feist um, magician series, yeah. And so I was making all of these parallels to to that series, and and picking up on your influences there. But I don't think you've ever read. I read the oh. magi I read magician only. Magician. That's the only Feist book I've read. 
Um, and I did read it before writing the trilogy. I cannot think of a single influence from there, though. I never, I remember Pug. Um, you know, I, I remember some of the characters. Well, and I, I find that Pug and Day Raven are are very similar characters. Um, yeah. And yet, yeah. I knew that you had not really ever read that series and weren't overly familiar with us. But yeah, just but magician. Maybe, you know, yeah. Just that stuff that was in my head um, was finding all those parallels. And yeah. In fact, actually, I, I, Lucian gave me a copy to read, and I still have it. Don't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I have Lucian's copy of Magician still. Yeah. So I don't know, like 20 something years later, whatever it is. Yeah. But yeah, no, yeah, it is fascinating to me. It's a question that I love to explore uh, for myself, but also to ask authors about. It's like influence questions. And I probably some authors get sick of that, but I never do. I think it's fascinating. Um, and what I, I, I think is absolutely certain is that Stuff, I mean, Tolkien called it um, the cauldron. No, not the cauldron. Somebody called it the cauldron of story. Tolkien called it the soup or something like that in his uh, essay on fairy tales. You get all this stuff that goes in here. You read all these stories over the years and they slosh around in your brain. And when you try to write your own story, a lot of that stuff makes its way in without you even realizing it. Um, it's just there, you know, and, and, Sometimes you don't realize it until somebody says, oh, actually, you know, that's a bit like uh, Tad Lim's Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're kind of right there, aren't you? I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. So I think that happens. And, and I love that. That's just, you know, every story ever told owes something to stories that came before it. Uh, that is for sure. And I think our job as people is to keep telling these stories and in new ways, but they're really very, very old stories, aren't they? Um, but we find new ways to make them engaging. Um, we find new ways to help them speak to people uh, with a fresh voice. Uh, so hopefully I've achieved that um, in, in the Adan trilogy. Um, so, all right. Anybody, any, uh, any of you three have any further questions for me um, about uh, the trilogy that you want to make sure we answer uh, or get to uh, contemplate before we finish up. I had one thing or well, a couple of things, but I really don't want to spoil too much for people, you know, um, some <laughs> direct comparisons between real world things and people and some of the characters in the books. Um, I just feel like it'd be too revealing. So I'll probably just right. ask you in private. Or something. We can do that off camera. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. All right, cool, cool. All right. Well, I want to thank you three. Uh, you have um, no idea how much your support means to me. Um, Trevor's been supporting me for a long, long time. Um, but just to have people reading this story, it's very, very, um, very moving to me. Uh, and to have people not only reading it, but to be picking up on stuff seeing stuff that I intended, seeing even beyond stuff that I intended and making me think, wow, that's really cool, you know, that uh, this person saw this in, in the story. It's been incredible for me and I'm, I'm just uh, more grateful than I can express. Uh, so thank you for reading the books, for uh, writing about them, talking about them uh, and uh, yeah, for being here. I, I appreciate it deeply. Thank you for having me. Was it was an honor to be asked and uh, included. All right. Thank you guys again. And uh, thank you everybody for watching. And until next time. <laughs>